Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. I'll say that again. Hello and welcome back. It's been a while. Fucking the world has gone a little bit nuts. I don't, uh, I don't even want to talk about it. And yeah, CB has lifted. Mm. So at least I've managed to get my party back and running again. So yeah. Uh, the time now is 7.37. And usually about 7, 8 p.m. ish, like the evening time is like the worst time to record my intros because, because everybody is like coming home from work. Um, you know, my mom and my sis will be coming home. There'll be noises at the door. People are in the living room. Um, sometimes my neighbors will walk by. There's traffic, you know, cars honking because it's peak hour. So I usually do my recordings in the afternoon when everybody is out. But it doesn't matter now, cause everybody's at home. And a lot has happened, uh, over the past few months. Personal things, things going on in the world. And, uh, I don't feel like sharing any of it now. So today's episode is brought to you by BC Flow State. Hmm. Rediscover the way you move, feel and perform through the use of natural and authentic movements that can help you build strength, regain your mobility, mobility, I don't know why I said it that way, and reconnect yourself with your physical body. Head on down to his Instagram page, bc underscore flow state, uh, and check out what he's been up to. Recently, he made a yoga video for Hokkien speaking seniors, uh, that actually went viral. I don't know if you noticed, like, if you went to, I think it was on Mothership or something. You can check it out on his YouTube page or on his IGTV sec, you know, that little IGTV part of his Instagram. And share it with your, your akong, your ama. It's really great. I, I saw it. I, I, I've seen it. It's really fun. It is very funny. And it's very, like, you can actually do it. You can actually, like it's, it's an actual thing that you can show your, your, your granny to do and they will probably understand it. So yeah, I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of you, bro, that you have been constantly creating content during this time and that you want to help out the seniors maintain their mobility as well during the lockdown. So yeah, good on you. He's also got a podcast, which uh, you can give a listen to, called All Grit, No Slack. Never look back. I'll give, uh, I'll leave all the details in the link below. Uh, oh, and uh, he's also created a mobility video for like, um to, to focus on back pains and back strange that he's going to do for the frontline workers, the healthcare workers. That's probably going to be coming out, I think, end of this week. So I think by the time you listen to this, if you look over to his Instagram page, it'll be there. So stay tuned for that. My guest today is none other than the wise and insightful Edmund Lao Shi. Um, Lee, Lee from episode 11, my Lao Shi. I mean, I got a lot of teachers. So Lee from episode 11, you can go and listen to her podcast, which I did. She was the one that introduced me to him a while back. And over time, I learned so much from him. And, and I've asked him to, to, to do this podcast many times, but he, he, he's a shy guy. He doesn't really want to be, you know, in the spotlight. He doesn't really want to have an Instagram or an online presence. He's one of those true yogis that like, would like live in a cave and like meditate in the forest, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I'm glad he decided to, 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 to do this with me. So I have a lot of respect for him. Um, we talk about his relationship with yoga, the differences in dualities and the power of theming. And if you've attended this class before, you notice that that is a very strong, uh, thing that he does in his classes. 
And uh, and if you know him personally, he also shares with us on this podcast a little bit more about his personal life. So that's going to be interesting to hear. And I had a great experience chatting with him. And I think you will have a great experience listening to it. So, um, yeah, just uh, without further ado, here is Edmund. Enjoy. It's been a while since I've done a potty. It's been a while since a lot of us have gotten back to how things were, considering the nature of what's been happening in the world. Okay. So, we wanted to do a pot before this whole thing happened. Mm. Then it happened, then we didn't get the chance. But now we do, three months later. Welcome, Edmund, to the big comeback of my party as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Aaron, for inviting <laughs> you to uh, your podcast session. Thank you, thank you. Okay. For context, you want to tell people a little bit about who you are? Mm, okay. Uh, hi everyone, those who don't know me, my name is Edmund. Uh, I'm currently, currently a teacher at home, coming to my one year teaching with the studio. Mm-hmm. And uh, pretty much been teaching for the past couple of years. Coming to about 10 years. It's been a long time. It's yeah, been a long, it's time, a long time. time. 10 years. Uh, well, for those of you who know me, I kind of like left my corporate job about two years back. Mm. So this is pretty much a new journey in my life, even though teaching itself has been a couple of years, but this whole experience of a full-time teacher and what this actually is, not just a career, but really like something that I'm sharing day in, day out, has mm-hmm. been pretty revealing. At the same time, challenging it in a lot of contexts. I guess most of the time, I would start out by asking a very standard question, which is how you got into yoga, what's your yoga story? Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, so how did you discover yoga and how did you keep doing it to the point where you are now? Mm. Uh, back then, before I started yoga, I was really in the gym, you know. So the gym is really kind of like the counterbalance to all the uh, stress from a desk-bound job. I was also doing a lot of uh, weights, dragon boat. So, uh. yeah, so a friend mentioned, you should do some stretching. And I say, why not? So that's how I kind of like started yoga. Just how old were you? Like... That was in my. I remember I was thirty year old, thirty years old. Okay. So that's about twelve years back. Right. Yeah, twelve, thirteen years back. So that was how I started. Not young, but not too old. I yeah, guess. you were the, fit already like, during that time. I guess so. Like with the running, with the dragon boat and stuff, fit. Mm. But then again, not really optimal. Okay. Those of us who do the practice will kind of realize that. You can be strong, but you're not necessarily well-rounded in that mm. sense, right? So that's how I kind of started on the mat. Uh, the first few years was really more about getting the poses done, having a kind of a good physical experience. Uh, Starts out physical at yeah, often times. At all times, pretty much for my case. And back to your question, how did I sustain yeah. this? I guess the moment of uh, later shift along the way so at the start is the physical the the high of doing the poses mm. getting excited to go to class feeling that sense of deep release yeah, yeah. You no know, deep release after a good good class and and i guess having fun nothing wrong with that to like kind of try the poses the inversion and stuff so that was what got me started doing for the first two years and as chance will have it uh, the gym I was in had a teacher training. Yeah, so my teacher training was actually from a gym. So that was how I kind of like started teaching. How, from from the point where you started practicing to the point where you decided to teach, how long was that? That was about two and a half years. So two and a half years into practice, then you decided you wanted to, teach. to take the teacher training to teach with the intention to teach. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So back then, it's like you have this I wouldn't say passion, but this this uh this thing they really enjoy. Mm. You know, as with all of us who eventually stand in front of the mat teaching, sharing, is this yearning to share what you really enjoy? Mm. It's like no different from you had a 
you watch a good movie, you just want to share it with your friends or a good meal, you know, check out this this restaurant. So that was kind of like how I started. Uh, and what got me going on throughout the years was uh, the teachers I met along the way. Teachers that you met that kind of like held your hand mm. on a certain part of the journey. Okay, and then along the way, they kind of like move on, not because you no longer go to class, but what they share with you will kind of like slowly shift away. And then another teacher comes in to kind of hold your hand. Yeah, so this is how like there are teachers along the way that kind of carry me, hold my hand along the way. Uh, for example, maybe at the start is the teachers you, teachers you go to to have a good practice, the arsenal. Then there are teachers along the way that came in to share on meditation. There are teachers along the way who basically, uh, in all aspects, you know, show you the seat of a teacher. These teachers won't be there when you're really new to the practice. Mm. Right? It's just about the poses at the start. But when you eventually step into the seat of, when you eventually become a teacher, then you need such teachers along the way that show you maybe a more holistic way. But then again, I'm just being pl- blessed that I have teachers along the way that kind of held my hand. Right, and these right. teachers aren't necessarily the teachers I go to because most of them are just visiting teachers, just a workshop and so on and so forth. But, but the thing with teachers and their teaching is that if it landed in you, like truly landed, mm-hmm. it will kind of stay with you. Maybe at that time, not too obvious, but along the way, it will get more and more clear. When the student is ready, the teacher exactly, will come. Yeah. So yeah. at that point, this was after your teacher training? Or after so. my teacher mm-hmm. training, and you know, you're just very enthusiastic, going for workshops, after workshops, mm-hmm. learning uh, poses, learning way to teach poses. But to put in context, if it's just really about that part of the yoga practice, I guess I will still teach, but the way I teach will be very different. I'm sure the way that you taught now, the, the way that you're teaching now versus the times where you first started teaching, mm-hmm. it's going to be very different and it's going to evolve over time. Yep. Um, okay. How, how has that evolution unfolded or how has it taken place? So how I share the practice or I teach basically is a microscopic lens of where I'm at. So to put in context, let's say the early part of my teaching journey is really about uh, being strong, you know, having that that sense of accomplishment, as you said. So the poses tends to be more driven through strength and getting strong, flexible, so on and so forth. Then along the way, as I happen to meet teacher showing about the more uh, holistic part, for example, meditation, then at times, it's not a just a big jump. It's a kind of graduate shift. So maybe the, the, the strong poses has its value, but you're weaving in a more meditative aspect into the way you do the poses itself. You can do a poses or any way of doing a practice simply more strength-based. Yet you can do it with strength, but the way you do it is more mindful. Intention. Exactly. You can do, let's say, a core work. It could be just rapid movement using momentum. So maybe a more mindful approach is to be in control, steady, then the breath comes in and you see how the breath works. And it is really more towards a slower way of doing things. Not necessarily easy, but it's just weaving in slightly different. Then as I get more into philosophy, contemplation, then obviously there's another shift. Then the sharing becomes not just a physical, not just the energetic, the mindfulness, then it becomes as a philosophical anger to... It becomes intellectual already. Uh, intellectual, yes. Uh, since uh, kind of like we know each other and we have a lot of conversation <laughs> over drinks, <laughs> yeah, over prata. Yeah, over prata. And yes, intellectual. And the way I look at the practice is generally very intellectual. Mm. Uh, more of a yana mindset. Mm. Mm. <laughs> 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 it's... it's, it's I'm just very excited to be able to have this opportunity to talk to you because we've, we've, I've asked you this many times before whether you wanted to come on the podcast and you were very hesitant at first and understandably so. You are, 
you are like a true yogi in the sense where you don't buy into the social media, you don't have an online presence and all this kind of thing. You just do your practice and you apply what you do on the mat, off the mat as well. So it's very inspiring and it's very inspirational. So I'm just taking a moment to be in that presence. But um, you talked about yana, being a yana yogi. Um, have you always been one and how has that shifted your practice? Teaching as well, not just practice. I guess I've always been one. Mm. So back then when I first started, like when we do our poses, the action while you're engaging, that kind of like has a very yana anger to it. So, Elaborate. So let's say if I do this pose, why mm. are certain people able to do it, yet I can't really manage it that well? Like, how am I feeling? This is from the perspective of a teacher. From a student, actually, way back as a student, I'm like interested in the body, anatomy, in a very gross level, like not really deep, deep, but just understanding like why there's the person beside me able to grab hold of something so easily, then yet I can't, mm-hmm. right? And why is certain people able to do certain poses yet I can't? So basically that thought of can or cannot actually has an analytical, intellectual angle to it. I guess that's the way I look at the practice. And that starts from the very physical. Then, and then as it goes on, you begin to explore like the breath, like why inhale works, why exhale works for some transition. Mm. So then again, it's also a very analytical mindset. Mm. Then eventually when I go towards more of a philosophical sharing, then it's more contemplation. It's more of like looking at maybe certain aspect of shifting the lens of looking at things. Once again, it's still also a very analytical yana mindset. So then what was your contemplation or what was your reflection having compared like the person next to you and you and what did that, what did what implications did that have to your own practice? So, just by observing how other people do it, you begin to like the, the way I look at it is that you begin to see what works for some may not work for me, and how this reveals itself is each of us has our own truth. Mm. Like your body proportion tells a lot of your whole yoga experience on the mat itself. Just the fact that you have a wider wingspan, narrow shoulder bind is so much easier. Mm. I'm more broad shoulder, I'm not that tall, so my wingspan is not that, that wide. So bind itself is hard. Then you'll be looking at why is this person struggling or binding, binding so easy, but I'm, easy. I'm, I'm, I'm binding hard. But then again, this truth reveals itself in a, in a how do I put it, uh, in a way that is honest. Mm. Because I'm not built that way to bind, binding in order to bind something, I have to twist even more. Mm. Makes sense, right? If you can bind so easily, you don't really create a rotation mm. in the spine, but then my truth is I have to create massive rotation. Mm-hmm. Then the next layer of it is, the philosophical angle of it is, does binding represent through the form or is binding expressed through the intent? So you see from a physical level, mm. you understand your truth, then it slowly reveals another layer, another layer, another layer. Well, that's a very intricate way of looking at a simple pose. And yes. I can understand that being a yana myself, maybe not to that level of, of understanding, but I understand the idea of honoring your body and mm-hmm. the limitations and the truth that your body... Like, if you can't put... If you can't bind, or if you can't put your foot behind your head and you force it, then you're lying to yourself saying that you can... You know, that's not to say that you can't do it. Eventually, through time, I'm sure uh, you'll gain more flexibility. Mm. But you forcing it is like you're resisting that, um, how to say, uh, it's like you're not being true to yourself. You know you cannot do, you want to force. Mm. So then what's the purpose of it? Is it to, to for the ego to look, to show people I can do it? Mm. Then it's, then you're not being honest with you. So then the yoga forces you to be truthful, right? It shows you or it almost punishes you if you force it, then you hurt yourself. It means you cannot. So then you have to be humbled by that experience. So then, to me, the the physical aspect of it translates to the philosophical aspect through that sense. Yes. But for yours, it's a little bit like one level higher where you interpret it in that way. I wouldn't say higher, but I guess you yourself actually express it the errant way. Mm. It's actually no different from my way. Oh, Basically, true, you, true. you're talking on the same thing as I mm. just did. Mm. And it's just simply, you realize that every time you stay on the mat, we all have a yoga experience. Mm. Your experience is different from mine. 
but doesn't mean that your experience is better than mine. That's we, true. we tend to mix it up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So how we get mixed up is because we see it through the form, the shapes, the accomplishment. Yet we often tend to not look at our experience itself. You can do a pose and it looks nice and great, but your inner landscape could be dramatically different. You could be strained, you could be gasping for breath, you could be just on a very good space. Mm-hmm. Yet by willing to not go into that form to honor spaciousness, ease, and you know that, that, that steadiness, stira sukam asana, you're actually doing yoga as opposed to doing a pose. Yeah, okay, okay, I get it. So then again, in terms of the sharing, like how do you Put, share that? Yeah, how do you get that across to students? So you, yeah. so back to the Yana way of doing it is, I give you that duality. Obviously, teaming it, teaming it creates a scaffolding, a platform. Yeah. But as much as the intent is there to share, whether or not <clears throat> the student eventually kind of grasps it, I cannot own that journey for that, them. They themselves yeah. have to step into that journey. That themselves. is the student's responsibility to take what he knows and applies it or in, in what, whatever way that he wants to. Well, in a way, if he can grasp the concept of, let's say, mm. the practice or the team or that, then it's just they themselves reflecting back. Mm. You know, it's like a mirror. Mm. So to me, the yoga practice is like a mirror. You now you can polish the mirror over and over again, then it shines back. Otherwise, you can do a lot of things, but you don't really polish it. It just gets very dull. And that's the thing, I guess, like, that's why the, the practice is powerful in a sense. Mm. Not so much of doing, but rather the space of being. Being right. is really the key essence of the practice. So then as a teacher, through teaching, all this is slowly revealed to you, as well as through the practice, yeah. right? The more you practice, the more you understand it. And then through teaching also, it comes from a different place and as you progress in your in your teaching career. How how then does this sort of um, what was my question? Uh, Something along teaching? Theme? Oh theme, yes, theme. Okay. So you were like you 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 theme a lot in class, almost all the time I think. And your themes are very your you have your like through theming you always have these, a theme within the theme. And you mentioned about duality and okay. truth, right? And yep. we talked about this before over yep. our Prata session where you said you always like to have these lessons, quote unquote lessons, weaved in your classes. And you spoke about how a class, say about the dualities of being a forward folding or, or back bending, and then the, the honoring the truth about whether you can or, or shouldn't do, mm. or to, to listen to your body at that time. Uh, mm. How did you find these these values? It pretty much boils down to my experience as a student mm. on the mat in a class. So as one of my friends shared before, like your experience on the mat itself, I'm not I'm not talking about good class. I'm talking about a real honest practice. A practice that's shared by the teacher. You should ideally experience the high and low, the annoyance, the accomplishment the frustration and the ease. So that itself gives you that inner landscape experience. I'm just using my experience to share that out. So to put into context, uh, obviously these are my experience as a student in classes. I'm not very good at standing balance because I'm flat foot. Okay, so I don't balance that well. And I remember this particular class whereby I was in the standing balance of the teacher was holding for long. We are all students who have been in that situa- situation before where the standing leg is fatigued, there's a lot of letting exit, you know, and the teacher is just not letting us release. And my experience is that there's so much frustration, right? But why am I not exiting the pose? Mm. I'm being frustrated to hang on to not be the first one to fall out. I am in a way, in a balancing posture, but energetically, mentally, I'm actually imbalanced. You realize that's a duality of what I'm trying to say. So I'm looking back at my experience as a student to then show it to you, or rather to share with you like, what is it that we're trying to find? Mm. Look at about the yoga practice, the stira sukam asana, that is also a duality, Mm. right? The yin and the yang, the sun and the moon, 
is duality, the world itself is duality. The way you practice also will have that duality. The thing is, we don't see the duality. We see what we want to see. And we just push that other shadow out of the picture. Mm. But then again, when we are tru- truly honest with ourselves, as I said, the experience on the mat, or rather my friends say, a good practice of that 60 minutes will bring you up and also bring you down. Your wow. practice is to navigate the midpoint, not get overly excited by the whatever you like to do. Neither are you backing away on the things that is your shadow work. Does that make sense? You're like creating this state of steadiness regardless of the form, the shape, the flow, the whole, so on and so forth. So let's say if I'm sharing a theme of balance. Yes, I'll be doing a standing balance, but my scaffolding, my team will be asking you to look inward to when you begin when you begin to have your energetic and mental imbalance. But to do that, I have to annoy you. I have to make you hold for long. Mm. Then you can really look back at when do I really let go with grace or holding on with frustration. That is the duality difference. Wow. How many people can... We are teachers before, right? When we do standing balance, we see people when they fall off the post. We see frustration. Mm. We all go through that because we don't want to be the one falling out, Mm. right? But if you can recognize that I can, I have tried my best, right? Today is just not a day that I'm, you know, balancing is very tricky. You Mm. can, I've shared this in class, you can be really good at unbalanced and pretty much nail it all the time. But there are days in standing balance that you just can't balance. Agree? Mm. And what if you are in that day? Do you not honor that space you're in? And let's say if the class happened to be a standing balance class, just acknowledge it. You try your best. Notice when the stirring comes up. You know the teacher's going to hold for long. Then you just let go. And go back to mountain. Recenter yourself. Why do you think people are so resistant with these dualities? Why do you think people... Is it a matter of the ego? I'm sure it is on some it level. Is. I don't want to say asway. I don't want <clears throat> to fall down. Right? Yeah. I'm supposed to be damn good at this whatever hmm. so so you mentioned a very uh, important point we go through life with ego it's just a degree of where your ego hmm. is the practice is actually mean, meant to strip that away bit by bit in whatever is meant to strip away so I started practice with a lot of ego this is my honest truth <laughs> You know, back in the days of the asana, the unbalance, and the fun part, I started the practice a lot ego because certain poses comes a bit easier to me because I do weight stuff and I'm more open to hips. Anatomically, I'm, uh, I'm just more blessed. <clears throat> and these are the things when the teacher goes into the unbalance, the hip opening, I'm like, yeah, man, this is my, my space. You no, know, I, can, I can show. I'll be the, the egotistic guy doing one legged crow while the class is barely struggling in crow. Mm. You know, it feels good. Uh, but then again, as I say, the practice landed and you begin to realize that why you do certain things in a class. What is that little tidbits of narration, narrative that arises when you decide to do something or decide not to do something? You can do something and it shows nothing. You cannot, you cannot do something and it, it shows, shows everything. everything. Yeah. That is the duality of... And it's so subtle. Exactly. It's very subtle. The thing is, you're trying to watch a pause in between when you decide to do something or not. Hmm. If you start inquiring yourself all over and over again on the mat, then you begin to see how that relationship you have with the yoga practice. You're speaking to yourself. Uh. In a way, you're trying to go... You're trying to see how you navigate your experience on the mat. Like, do I do this or do I not do this? Hmm. You know, back to your point, like, I may get injury, you fall. And it's the same thing. You are not maybe... This is not your truth. But because you're in a haste to accomplish, then you force, you hurt, then you just have to acknowledge that. You know? But often than not, we begin to blame the practice. We blame the teacher. Right. We have never really asked at ourselves, not to blame ourselves, but have I lost my way? It's, it's tricky because these are things that it's not easy to share. It's hard to face, so you, don't, yeah, to you don't want to, like, no one wants to blame themselves. Oh. I, I fell out of it because you asked me to hold for five minutes, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But you could have stopped at any time. You could have just rested while you hurt yourself. I mean, we as teachers always give students the space to you know, honor yeah. your truth, which is really what we want. But this is the point where 
I would at Tanshan in class there. When does a student become a practitioner? Hmm. We are all students in the class of ten, twelve, fifteen. You can go through a class of sixty minutes. The poses, the flow, the whole. When does that one student evolve and shift to become a practitioner? What you say is a point. You become responsible for your own action. The teacher is just facilitating a space for you to navigate your experience, right? So, as you say, that five breath. When it's like back to why I say like setting balance. You know, I really I would have when I'm doing that kind of sharing, I would really preface the class that we're gonna stand for long. We're gonna be in standing balance for long. Then so obviously that uh, that focus on looking inwards when you become in balance. I have given you the stage. I have given you the space for you to navigate your experience. If end of the day you still you no know, hold it and get frustrated, I cannot be. As Om Chan said, the student has to be responsible for their own practice. The day that they decided to let go and return back to mountain with a smile on their face, they then shift from a student to become a practitioner. They become responsible for their own action on the mat, their own experience on the mat. What I'm hoping to share is to give that space for a student to start that slow shift. It's hard because. This kind of thing can you can share it, but once the class starts and the frustration comes in, it's not easy to return back to that.、Mm. But if we, or rather, in my case, if I as a teacher go through that as my experience as a student, I'm getting a lot of my team and experience really from my space as a student.、Mm. The challenge I have, the frustration I have, you know, I'm trying to bring it into into that that something space. Something that something that people can. Digest, ah. Digest.、Know. Hopefully, think about. Learn from, ah. Yeah. Whether or not they get it, that practice or not, ultimately that's not what I'm here for.、Mm-hmm. I'm here to be that mirror, or the yoga be the mirror for you to reflect back. Interesting. Interesting. There's so many levels to this. There's loads. There's so many levels as the practitioner, as the student. You're looking at it from so many different angles. And even say if I'm a teacher, but when I step into the shoes of a student, when I when I practice instead of teach, there are times when I catch myself not honoring what I need to honor, and maybe there are times I I I blame the teacher or I blame the the weather or the whatever lah whatever external factors I blame. That's why I'm not in a good mood today. That's why I couldn't hold my balance.、Yep. But then. I'm I'm the I'm the I'm the teacher. Like, how come I cannot? You know, I'm supposed to know all this stuff by now. So then, coming from your own place, it's still a lot of things to slowly learn and to slowly uncover. And the practice reveals that to you through time. You know,、yeah. it's very interesting. So back to what you mentioned, and once again, like these are I'm just sharing quotes along the way from friends that I have conversation with. It's like we're all just human.、Mm. We are just human, right? So, like as you say, we are teachers. We should kind of in a way. Embody or know the essence of practice, but we're all humans. When you step on the mat,、uh, our humanness experience comes in, right? Yet, if you never chance to dwell deeper, it's like you just keep on reinforcing that mindset.、Hmm. So the practice is actually asking to pause, press that pause button. Like you say, you'll be asking, "Why am I feeling this way?" The day you decide to pause and ask yourself. Maybe today you don't get it. You just play forward, okay? And if you pause often enough, one day the pause may rewind. And one, if you pause enough, maybe one day you don't even need to pause because you no longer get triggered so much. But you need to know how to pause first.、Hmm. You need to know where to press the button for pause. We don't really see that button. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you need to pause to ask yourself why. What happens? Why am I feeling triggered? We are triggered in so many different ways.、Mm. Could be a habitual pattern. You know, the teacher I like, I don't like the poses I like to do or don't like to do. When you pause enough, you begin to ask. You begin to kind of trace back. Like this is because of this, hence that, cause and effect. But you realize that this is interdependent. Yet at the same time, if you kind of like unhook yourself from this trigger, not to say you will not be triggered, but maybe the whole. 
when you time. when you step back and take a look at yeah. it from a different or a wider perspective. Wider perspective, right? you know. And then if you keep on going back to that practice over and over again, I do honestly believe at a point in time, you it's a bit like meditation. You don't roughly know when that thing is gonna come up, but you're able to not suppress it. The key is not suppression. You're able to see it arise and let go. Or maybe you have come to a place of true ease whereby what used to trigger you no longer trigger you. And that is the power of the shift. Hmm, I guess if you, tr- if you relate it back to say the standing balance where you felt like, you know, a year ago you fall out of it, you get frustrated. But then through experience, you fall out of it and you have a smile on your face and, and that no longer triggers you. Yeah. That simple analogy applied to off the mat can yes. translate to so many other things as well. Yes. Somebody bumps into you, you want to fight him. A year later, he bumps into you. You're it's fine. fine. It's exactly. Because whatever, you know, you exactly. just carry on with the day. But you see, this hmm. kind of shift doesn't happen overnight. Like that. Yeah, you don't do a, it, you yeah. don't do an awesome class and things that you become that person. Hmm. It takes a lot of self awareness contemplation and fundamentally a practice right practice. why do we call this a practice practice in the sense where it's done every day little over by little. and over again mm. and the thing is with a consistent practice you realize that not it, it's not incremental there are days where you kind of fall off mm. but this is what a true real practice is because you practice every day you know when you fall off so they can go back again it's different when you practice like once in a blue moon because you don't see that consistency of how day-to-day things are slowly changing. That's true. And, and I think that that, um, that practice, that cons- the, the being able to see the practice is in terms of say, you're able to see it through flexibility. Today I can touch my toes. Yes. Uh, the, yesterday I couldn't. Today, you know, one month later I can. Yes. And that is like a very easy like you can see that progression yes. yep. it's encouraging and it keeps you wanting to come back mm. there are times also when you are tight and then what you could do today you couldn't do tomorrow and that's also part of the practice where it shows you like yeah you can do your handstands good for you you're very strong you're very tight but then maybe today for some reason you can't find your balance it's yep. not a matter of strength anymore right then can you still be okay with it right and yes. it humbles you again yes Hmm. very contemplative very interesting how hmm how long did you take to come to this kind of conclusions how then actually like how how was it like back then the yoga before before now with all the Instagram live class and all the Lululemon stuff you know like how was yoga like back then 10 years ago it was a much simpler time. <laughs> it was a much simpler time. Well, I can only share that my yoga journey started and for a good five, five six years or so was really at the gym. You know? uh, 2007 is where I first started. I think social media only started picking up pace in 2010, 11, I, I guess around that time. So, what you do is pretty much seen by people in the class. You realize it has a lot of implication. Uh, it's, oh, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. Go on, that, go on. That is really how things have, things have evolved. So you're saying like, say for social media, where you're able to, quote unquote, show off your flexibility or your strength, it's, it's almost like, the like it's an extension of the classroom where you can show off in a way so back to what i was sharing like earlier on uh, i started practice a lot of ego you know like doing the additional option that the gym may or may not even give uh, and this is where it gets really interesting because i felt great during doing that you know but somehow something in me just felt doesn't feel right and I, I can't say for everyone, but it's just how I felt it doesn't feel right. In what sense? Uh, like, why am I doing this additional option where the class... Ah, this is it's one, not necessary. Uh, the whole teacher didn't even give option. I still remember that class. Uh, 
me and my friend was in class. We we're doing crow, but I kind of like really know how to do one like a crow. So I was like doing one like a crow, and it felt nice out. Like you can show off. But uh, yeah, I guess what it's like. What I say, like when you do something, what's the purpose? Yeah, what's the intent? You can intention? do something and it shows nothing. Yeah, you cannot. You can decide not do something and it shows everything. So this are the thing that obviously back then I was like too new. I wasn't even a teacher back then. But these are things that I guess it, it's just like in the back of my mind. But obviously it wasn't crystallized in that way. It's just like why am I doing that? I mean, the fact that you question yourself at that time is already part of the yoga doing its work. Yes. Right. Yes. It's showing you. It's asking you to question because you sense something was off. Why I, did I have to do it? Exactly. And and you said like how. By doing something, it shows nothing. Yeah. Say so you did the one legged crow and nobody asked you to do it. It showed that, okay, law, you're good, law, you can it do it. Yeah. But if you could and you still didn't do it, that shows something a little bit more about yeah, yourself. But what is a little more, only you yourself yes. can know your you own know, answer. Yeah. Because each of us have our own interpretation of what the practice is, mm. what the pose is. Mm. And this gets really tricky. So, in a class of a lot of doing, what is it they are trying to be? So it's not a lot of doing. It's really about being. The, the yoga practice is really about being. Steadiness is a being state. Ease is a being state. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. You cannot do ease. You can only be at ease. Mm. The shape, the form, is as it's just something more than an expression of that ease and that space. But no one can say whether when you do this pose, are you spacious or at ease? That's just an illusion. Wow. So it's not doing, it's really about being. And that yeah. being is really your own inner truth. And no one can tell you that, but at the same time, no one can take it away from you. So that's what I'm trying to share. It's like, it doesn't really matter whether you can do A, B, C, or D. And if you've been in my class, I do kind of like go a bit stronger, harder. But this is what I meant by that duality. If I don't push you into one area, you have never a chance to ask yourself, why do I go so deep? So if I go into a really deep lunge, it's one thing to do it for two, three breaths in a flow class. If I do it like, hold it longer, then you'd be annoyed with me because I make you hold longer. Mm. But I never ask you to go so deep. Even though I say, going deeper, deeper and deeper. You see what I'm trying to say? I'm giving you that duality. I'm asking, I'm giving you an option to go deeper. But the thing is, the depth is you define your practice. This is so abstract. It's and very it's, abstract. Yeah. It's abstract. And I get it. And it's hard to convey something like that in a 60 minute class. But that's very interesting because then that is the student's responsibility to see what that is. Whether it's a matter of ego, I want to hold because, you know, or maybe it's a whatever, like whatever the yeah. reason. And also, like what you said about ease and stability and, and of that being a state of being, sometimes when you are stable mm. that helps the next person be stable as well if, if you know like if I look at the, my neighbor and, mm. and he or she is very calm in that pose it helps me feel calm if the person next to me is like gonna toe already uh, mm. I also feel like it's like I'm gonna toe already yeah. so that is almost infectious and it's it translates um, like it can it can be spread uh, you know mm. so then your responsibility as the student or as the practitioner might be to help that person next to you. If the person is a beginner struggling in that one dog or whatever, if you lower the knees down, he will see, hey, that guy strong, eh? but he lower the knees. Eh? Maybe I can lower the knees as well. Not so, I don't feel so bad anymore. You know, you might, it might be a different kind of responsibility. I think what you say makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Because there's a lot of uh, collective energy in the class. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe from my perspective is that when I'm the mat as a student, I can only be responsible for my own practice. Ah, that's true as well. So back to like, do I lower the knee or not? Depends on what I want to What you embrace. want to do lah, yeah. Exactly. It really not, I mean, I, all I can say is that I wouldn't like to think that what I do hopefully doesn't affect the other person. Because I hope that the other mat neighbor, fellow practitioner, take care of their own practice. Mm. I guess that is really, otherwise it's, so two things, there's a collective energy, yes. Like, if the class is steady. So one good example is someone comes to your class, is very mindful, you begin to see the people around them starts to move mm -hmm. a bit slower. Mm -hmm. So that's the collective energy, right? Uh, and that's powerful, right? That's powerful. 
but eventually like the debt the options uh, you kind of have to navigate your own experience or be responsible for your yeah. own experience I mean, you can't itself. always be following that particular student's yeah. lead or speed or tempo. Kind of, yeah. Eventually, you will move faster or you'll go harder or you'll go softer. Depends on what you want to embrace yeah. as a but student. Then, as a general sense, it's still a state of ease hmm. rather than... Uh, like, if I want to stay in my uh, child's pose versus I want to uh, stay in my inversion, that's hmm. still ease, yeah. right? There's still a sense of ease because this person is helping you, that person is helping you, or you are helping them. Because ease is subjective. Mm. And the beauty of it is, if you're a backbender, I put you in a backbend, you're comfortable. If you're not a backbender, I put you in any remotely not deep backbend, you are struggling. Then the shape and form actually has no, has no bearing. It's really your own inner. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Very content, very contemplative, and it's also back to the duality thing. The yep. duality thing, what you said about yep. about um, finding that balance. Uh, yeah, you mentioned something. I had a brain freeze. Anyway, mm. given today's climate, given the current situation that we're all in now with right. the with the pandemic, we're all faced to we're all forced to face. Mm. our own fears our own insecurities being cooped mm. up at home and then now having the CB lifted we all can come back into the mat has there been any shift in energy for you or for your students that you noticed okay for me being an introvert this whole two and a half months of being in a circuit breaker mode has been a breath of fresh air Mm. You know, back then, before the whole circuit breaker started, I was kind of like teaching a fair bit. So, that that two half months was kind of a chance for me to like return back to a more simpler practice. Like, and it, it, it suits me well because I think I was in a very comfortable space. I don't have to head out. I can do my sitting in the morning. I can do almost days like two practice a day. But the thing is, I'm an introvert and that space suits me well. Okay? But there was a teacher circle hosted by Lee sometime back, you know, or, or our common friend. And that teacher circle, what dawned on me was that some teachers, folks, are actually struggling with that, that confined space. And this is where actually I felt that we all go through a shared common experience externally about inner stirring but the inner is actually very different so makes sense yeah and this is really where I felt that we have to kind of on each other's space so I may be comfortable in that space but I can't deny that you're actually very uncomfortable Mm. being constrained so if we can kind of like look at it from that perspective what bond us is our commonality of the experience itself like in a circuit breaker mode but what actually grows us is very different I grew because I'm in a very comfortable space you had your challenge but the challenge itself like you know you feel very uh, angsty not able to go out but you're able to learn from that then that is also your growth so I'm right, but doesn't mean you're wrong. I it's, it's, it's like the backbender in a backbend class, comfortable. Exactly. But then the the non-backbender in the other, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. But it's the same thing, like just see what you're used to. Lo. What you're used to, and and I guess a lot of time that our experience of something that's great can't kind of validate us. Yeah. And we forgot that it's just simply our perspective. Everything is through your own the world is through our own perspective but if we see the world as a terrible place everything in the world becomes terrible mm-hmm. if we change that perspective the, pre- the whole world changes but what I realized for this whole uh, this whole pandemic is that I can see that way from my lens but I cannot impose my view on you mm-hmm. and this is what gets blurred along the way how I view some things because it's my truth, hence it has to be your truth. Why are you not seeing it this way? Right. 
So for example, let's say for me, uh, I guess we had this conversation, you know, before the whole circuit breaker that we're pretty okay with the situation. Mm. You no, know? it's like it's not a good situation. Yeah, at the same time, certain things are in place. And it goes back to that what we talk about, like that, that faith and trust that mm. eventually if I meet Aaron for a Prata session before the whole circuit breaker, I trust Aaron he himself is not sick. You know, it's just having this trust. And this trust and faith actually liberates us even though we felt being weighed down. But this is how I feel it. But I can't deny someone that actually felt that they don't want to go out. Going out actually terrifies them. And if I'm assuming someone is along that space, I also have to honor that mm. and not say that, hey, why are you like that? Mm. It's okay. It's okay for me, but it doesn't mean it's okay for them. And this is where I guess if we can understand that, we as a whole can grow together. Makes sense. Yeah. It's about showing compassion. It's about showing understanding. And there are times where we will never be able to relate to what that other person is feeling. Exactly. And back to the perspective thing about how we view our lives in a certain way. So that to us is our truth. Mm. The, you know, I see the something fall, I gravity. That's, a, that's my truth already, what? Before we know gravity maybe doesn't exist. Maybe this is all a simulation, now, right? You can you can think that. But as much as how you want to believe what you want to believe, there are other people who see life in a different way. And sometimes we get upset or we get angry or frustrated about that other person's views because to us it's very clear what this means. Mm. Why are you so scared to to come out and eat? You know, why why are you doing all this? Why are you being led through fear? Mm. But then from their perspective, it might not be fear that leads them. It is caution. It is huh? um, safety. You know, like, hey, I'm doing the smart thing by taking precaution, by staying at home and not meeting anybody for like a year or something like yeah. that. So, there's like two layer to that. Like the first thing, once again. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like you can acknowledge that and you can hold a very neutral space for that difference. But I guess what saddened me, and I share with you a few times, is that what saddens me throughout this uh, whole period was that we tend to impose our view onto others, right? As much as we say we practice, this is yoga, and what yoga should encompasses, mm. you know, that equanimity, so on and so forth, and that um, compassion. Mm. I felt at times, this doesn't really truly uh, illuminate that. The practice that we've been trying to do mm. may in a way, indirectly blur the line. Let me think about this for a minute. I get it. It's hard or it's it's hard and it's also like we want to try and impose our truth onto other people mm. because we believe that that is the right way. Mm. Right? That is that is our way of what and if you are against that, then you're against my whole way of thinking, my whole existence. Is, in a way. In a way, you know, you go against everything that I believe in. So that's a personal attack, you know, and we defend it. No, what you're doing is wrong, you must do it my way. Mm. Same with the other person, like, um, I want to do it this way, whatever, whatever. How do we find that balance? How do we, how are we able to come to an understanding if we are so polarized in that sense? To be honest, I don't have an answer. Mm. There might not even be an answer. That hence the duality where you have to have the yin and the yang. And that's in, one. And both those find balance that's within one. each other. What? But you see, the beauty of that duality is that there always be a center line. Mm. So you're trying to hopefully through the practice come to that center line. Like as we mentioned like I have a certain way of navigating my experience in this whole situation. You have your experience. Mm. So there's like two polar. Yet the space in between where we agree that you're right doesn't mean I'm wrong. Yeah. It's the middle line. And like what you mentioned, like example, like what I do on the mat as a student hopefully collectively affect the mat neighbor beside me. Mm. I think we thought about that, yeah. right? But the reality of it is, as I also mentioned earlier, is that I can only take care of my practice. If my practice and weight is able to let you see something different, then that's great. But I can only be in my practice. So that means 
instead of reacting, I reflect. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I guess because this whole pandemic is honestly speaking is a generation defining moment, pretty mm. much, right? Globally, we go through this in a way, obviously different uh, way of handling it, but but this is where it gets tricky because how we want to in a way impose. Yeah. Uh, we can you know, we can have this long conversation, but end of the day is I truly believe that there will be a place in between where we can be authentic, honest, holding a good neutral space, and we just simply affirm each other and their differences. We tend to affirm people who agree with us. Mm. How often do we affirm other people's differences? That's true. Mm. That is true. Because if I'm comfortable in my practice and what I truly believe in, it's easy. One. It's, yeah, it's very yeah, easy. But the thing is, the, the, the tricky part is like, what we do on the map, we get validated, affirmed, and, and it gets so clear that this is who we are and how we view things. Mm. Like what you say is like, if people view it otherwise, we felt, we felt threatened. threatened. Yeah. But that's just a very gross level of the whole practice. The deeper level is actually the dissolution of all that. You glimpse your truth, okay? It affirms you, but we don't often realize that other people also glimpse their truth. Mm. You, you see, that's a, that's a part that we tend to forget. So if you have been validated so much by your truth, how can you deny that other people have also seen their truth, although it's different from yours? It, we, we took on the high road whereby our truth becomes their truth because I've been affirmed by my truth. Is there a right or a wrong you know? I really don't know. This is really a philosophical question to be debated. Mm. But the way I, I have learned through my uh, practice over the years is that uh, it used to really bug me that why you don't get why you don't get me. At times like the humanist experience do arise, like why don't you get me? But as I say, if you pause enough, often enough, when the why don't you get me arises, you can just see and let go and become the next narratives that why don't you get me but I also do get you so we are mm. actually okay we're okay but we're not okay la. kind of mm. yeah, but it's really hard you see it's really really hard currently in you know as we mentioned like this whole social media thing is really mm. it's powerful but at the same time it's powerful maybe in a not so good way mm. because it becomes an echo chamber After, I mean, this is an, after like mentioning what we mentioned just now about not being able to find that middle ground with people, you think you're open enough to share about what we are talking about in terms of your situation? Uh, sorry, a bit more. So context. like we were talking about <clears throat> uh certain people not being able to understand us mm. and finding that peace with that this difference. Okay. And if we relate it back to your personal situation, my, how has that affected you? And my, if you can, you can share some context. You mean my personal space? Oh. Your, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be very subtle to lead into it, but anyway. I hear you, I hear you. Yeah. So... Uh, so and, uh, uh, while you think about it, this was also Angie's question, which was, what's um, that question? She wanted to ask, when and how did you realize that your dharma was to become a father, mm. and what was it like to grow apart from your partner? Okay. Uh, firstly, her first question: How do I realize my dharma is to be a father? Mm. So as far as I can remember, I have always wanted to be a father. Okay, it's just simply this, this thought that I want. Okay, but underneath that thought is this feeling of being unsatisfied. Being being a father. No, no. So no. So you think about it, right? I like I want to be a father. Okay, that's just like I want to be a father because of like forming a family unit, for example. But underneath that sentence, for me, is this going through? life 
in a way feeling unsatisfied. Okay, not not because like you don't have a job, you're struggling. It's just, it's just like things are missing. fine. These things are fine. You know? Uh, you know, I was together with my ex-wife, and you know, we, we go through life. The job is okay. Uh, I mean, good good salary, good pay. And we have a like, yearly or twice a year traveling and stuff. But the moment you start to sit with yourself, like truly honest with yourself, there's this sense of being unsatisfied, and I cannot put a word to it. It's just like not complete. Mm. Okay? So when my daughter was born, and yes, I am very, 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 very happy that I became a father. But what truly illuminated the Dharma for me was I felt complete. I felt satisfied. Mm. It's like the book by Stephen Cole, uh, whereby he mentioned that if you have glimpsed your Dharma and to not fulfill your Dharma, it will destroy you. Oh, that's intense. That's intense. But this is really what the Dharma is. It's like, you might have a certain aspiration when you're young to be a painter, for example. And whatever life choices you made kind of move you away from that. Right? But let's say down the road when life takes on a shift and you start to take up the, that paintbrush and start painting. And I was like, maybe you felt this overwhelming fulfillment. Mm. And I was like, you really glimpse that back that Dharma and like to not pursue that in a way, it's it's at you. Yeah. You know? So that book, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty powerful. Like he, in that book, he showcased a lot of uh, well-known figure mm. you know, and how like their Dharma it has been shown so clear since they are young. And yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. It's a pretty hard concept. It's like, even I don't know it's that. It's very intuitive la, for you to understand. And what was powerful was that I don't even know that. I just know that I'm happy. And then I have a conversation with another student after a class. And I can't remember what the conversation was, but without even thinking or having, having had that thought ever, I just told that student, which is my friend, that my dharma is your father and just came out from the blue. Like, my inner consciousness was putting out the words. It's not even like thinking about, you know. It's like, yeah, I'm happy to be a father, you know. But that's one thing, like, I just want to be clear, like, the Dharma of being a father is very different from being a good father. I guess you need to see a difference. Some parents could be awesome parents, but what sparks them could be not being a parent. Hmm. It's something that's very, very intricate. And only yourself can kind of know, like, what makes you feel complete? Like, if I say, Aaron, tomorrow you're going to die. Do you live with sadness, sense of regret? Or you live this world with a sense of being complete? Complete in the sense that you've done your bucket list, but at a very internal your level, call, uh. yeah, you felt you're complete. And this is something that we don't really ask ourselves hmm. often enough. If you can ask yourself that question, and you're able to find that question, or the answer to that question, what arises may truly be your dharma. Because once you, hmm. com- well, once you complete, once you are able to step into that space, a part of you actually feels, I'm okay. Hmm. Are there multiple dharmas? Yes, possibly. Okay. Uh, Interesting and okay. Like, if Aaron, you do now my turn to interview. If you were to leave the world mm. in one week's time, would you live with grace or would you live with sense, some sense of resentment? And if there's a some sense of resentment, what is it you're unhappy about? I think everybody will leave, or rather, like given this timeline, like you're gonna die tomorrow. Everybody, well, let's say we take away fear and all that, right? Mm. That that. Would I feel fulfilled? Would I would I leave with grace and not like be kicking and screaming, I'm not done. Uh. Yeah. I'm sure everybody on some level will feel like they could have done more, right? If if uh, given the, the means uh, or given that uh, there's always going to be regret, oh, I wish I had said this to that person or yeah. hadn't said that to that person or being nicer to this or had done that or, or went there or okay, stuff. So if I can pause. Yeah. What you have just shared are, for a better word, quite superficial. Mm. 
there always be things you can do better. I could always be nicer. I could always be so on and mm-hmm. so, so forth. Having done all that, assuming you can, do you feel complete? Let me think about It's a this. feeling of being complete that's a key. Like, feeling complete and fulfilled versus doing things that you think you should have done better. Mm. That's actually a difference. Mm-hmm. And okay, that okay. is the question you have to ask yourself. Mm. You, you see what I'm trying to get at? It's yeah. like the feeling of being fulfilled that... I, I think I'm... I feel like I might be okay with that mm-hmm. idea. But then again, it's not. I'm not actually going to die tomorrow. I wouldn't know how I actually feel. But if you ask me right now, I don't think so. I think I feel quite complete. Okay. But then that doesn't give me assurance because then I feel like I, I, I don't think I've accomplished anything uh, like... Like, I don't think I've found my dharma. And for me saying this, that I'm okay with things if I die tomorrow, like, does that mean that I don't have a dharma? I don't know. You have to see. Yeah, I don't know either. At, this at is end of the day, this kind of contemplation inside, we tend to feel that we need to find an answer. Yeah, I feel like I at don't time, like the answer of at times, being okay. And at times, like, maybe there is, isn't really the really answer. Mm. And the answer to review itself, it's great. It's your own insight. Mm. But if we have never really asked ourselves that question over and over and over again, like when I ask you the question, I'm not sure I thought about this before during our Prata Chillax, but you do realize that your intellectual mind is trying to give you your answer back to me. But not my... Not your truth. Yeah. And Because I'm the, thinking of it intellectually. Yes. Like, what, what thing I haven't yeah, done. Exactly. Yeah. And this is nothing wrong. This is the thing that... Because, uh, because the thought of dying is not a question that we often entertain. Mm. You know? And the thought of like sitting with ourselves, the thought of dying is even more daunting. You can talk about dying, like having this conversation and it feels okay. I mean, you can pause thing a bit, but to sit by yourself and think about dying and what makes you feel fulfilled, unfulfilled, so on and so forth can be really scary mm. but we don't often go into that space enough for whatever needs to arise to arise I'm not saying that you definitely will get your Dharma answer mm. and that's really not the point mm. the point as we all practice is the inquiry Svadhyaya ask yourself like like why do I do one like a crow why do I do or not do this why do I do or not do that so you constantly ask yourself over and over again regardless on and off the mat something in you like bad as I shared like why do I do one like a crow it feels great when I do it but something in me felt why and that one thing trigger the next time I go into class do I do it maybe because sure huh? why you ask yourself over and over again then you realize that my truth is that I don't really want to do it you're doing it not for yourself, you're doing it for them, exactly. for the, the people around because you. Look then, at me, how great exactly. I am. Exactly, that's, that's whereby if you ask yourself often over and over again, the inquiry is stripping away the layer of the ego narrative over and over again, such that you can uncover something that's intrinsically you. Does everything have to have an intention behind it? Does every action have to have a reason. Can I just do it for the sake of the act itself? Uh, example? Just to get a bit of clarity. Uh, uh, I don't know, like, say, like, if I want to take a walk, or if I just, I don't know, if I want to do something that has no reason to do it, mm. if I want to just go and learn how to make, uh, do pottery. Okay. I don't particularly like pottery. I don't have the time for it, but I just feel like, yeah, you know, I just have two hours here. I'm just going to go to this class. Oh, actually, that's a bad example. <laughs> I don't know what I mean by that. Hmm. But it feels like, like I mean, what I'm trying to ask is that if everything is questioned, why do I need to do this? Can things be done without a reason? Yes. Hmm. Go back to what I shared from the early, early on in the podcast was that I'm a Yana. Hmm. Hence, my, this is how I'm... Yeah, everything doing. must have reason. Or rather, hopefully there's some inquiry yeah. involved. We talked about this just earlier uh. at the uh, Yakun before we started the podcast was that you know our friends who are bhakti they don't need to think of reason thinking reasons give them headache they go with a feel mm. that is their truth you have your ah. answer and the feeling the feeling lead, being led by the feeling is 
the intention is, is that true is um, I feel like doing it so I do it and that is what is yeah but see the thing is and I'm not judging is that you kind of need to know when you tend to be led by feeling no right or wrong likewise I, I tend to do things too analytically I don't feel enough I mean we are all we are never really in true balance but if you realize that you tend to go through things with a lot of feeling and what you like I'm just assuming the, the basis of feeling is that we tend to grab it towards what we like yeah. make sense yeah, yeah that's how we feel you know, we say in class do this option if it makes you feel good or do whatever makes you feel good nothing wrong with that but then me being Yana would then ask you let's say a bhakti do you go through that usually feeling good that you want to feel good I guess okay then does it mean that this itself makes you imbalanced does the fact that you need to not do things to do things that doesn't make you feel good also you're not doing the things that don't feel good to find balance or to put it this way it's like if you tend let's say off the mat you tend to do things that makes you feel good mm. but in a way this itself and compound it. yes compound is something that's actually a bit negative yeah. I mean on the mat who knows how your life is off mm. the mat but then the question is if generally you tend to go through life doing things that makes you feel good but at the expense of others like or it depends of yourself yeah. or people accede to you or you're yeah. demanding because it makes you feel good so on and so forth then the practice itself on the mat is not to make things that makes you feel good it's to make you pause and ask yourself why you do it it's really about that very that thing. contemplative thing la, yeah. about finding balance once yeah. again because you cannot keep doing the things that you want to do <laughs> exactly. or that make you happy or that exactly. feel good so I give you an example first like we go on we start on the mat with our, all of our own baggages and, and our life experience I also met practitioners who are very self-conscious, mm. shy, right? Maybe they are afraid to speak up, like their church chakra is stuck, okay? In classes, then I will encourage you, affirm yourself, do things that makes you feel good. Because off the mat, you tend to... Restrict. Exactly. So to do something or not, you know what I'm trying to say? It's like what we talk about, like, you can do something and it shows nothing. You cannot do something and it shows nothing. So let's say for someone that was always being led by feeling good, you know, mm. people accede to them. Then on the mat, if you give them the option, do something that makes you feel good. Yeah, you do it. It feels good. But doing that means nothing. But if you can frame it in that practice, that team, you know, I'm not sure how you can frame it, but to pause and decide that I decide not to do things that make me feel good. I decide to step into my shadow by not doing what makes you feel good. It shows everything. Hmm. It's complex. I mean, it's it's really complex. Uh, yeah. Does that <laughs> fry your brain? You look it like you're. Does it's I'm 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 I'm, I'm re- reflecting on what we talked about, what you we've said, and I'm reflecting it on my own personal experiences and and seeing if it makes sense at that point of time during my life, or whether I could have done this in a certain way, or whether I could have. Ref- contemplated a different uh, you know it's, it's, it's always very contemplative and I like to re- I like to reflect on all these things hmm um, but I mean just want to clarify that in no way my sharing is meant to say this is better than the other it's just simply no, it's not, yeah, going back I, to that intent as you say like the contemplation of when yeah. you do something or not option or not what is the underlying narrative yes it's just about asking yourself like what what like Awareness, la, like, hmm? what is this? You know, In all context. Uh, you want to talk about soul connection? Uh, yeah. So, back to uh, Angie. Sorry. Second question was... It's going to take out his watch. Okay. It's annoying. You yeah. keep hearing the click, click, click. <laughs> okay. Uh, soul connection. And this is also what we talked about yesterday at Yakun. So, fucking love Yakun. Yeah. So, uh, in my personal space, I uh, kind of separated with my wife uh, about coming sometime late last year so uh, it was not easy uh, we've been together for literally more than half my life I knew her when I was 18 years old I'm now 43 yeah. so you go ahead and do the math yeah. but what dawned on me was uh, when we kind of knew each other we were still young we were trying to find our own identity 
And I guess over the years we grow. Me with my yoga and obviously her with her own life. But what I learned throughout this whole、uh, journey is that often at times the partner we have is actually a companionship, which we talked about yesterday. And why is this companionship? Could be something that's as simple as liking the same movie, enjoy the same food. You know, this is like more of the base aspect. Then that's like kind of companionship. As long as we enjoy doing things together, that's fine. But it's about the different vibration we should talk about. Vibrations is a nice word too. Yeah, vibrations yeah. like that is just a very base, low base vibration. The next vibration is basically about how you go through. Well, as I would say. Day to day life, like your own ethics and stuff. You know, are you truthful? Are you honest? Are you generally more resentful? So on and so forth. That's our second vibration.、Mm. We can be companion on the base level, but the next level itself, if it doesn't align, it, it's going to create a lot of dissonance. Okay. Then the next higher level is like basically the philosophy of life itself. Obviously, this adds on、uh, the the core values and the ethics itself adds on to the philosophy.、Mm. Well, general philosophy of how you approach life. So I guess、uh, my journey, my X Y was that we knew each other when we were young. We we're trying to find our own identity, and it was great. You no, know? it was companionship. We enjoyed certain things doing together. But <laughs> yoga happened to me, I guess, <laughs> for lack of better words.、Uh, we talk about life <laughs> before yoga. Yoga ruining your life. Yeah, yoga ruining your life. Quote Richard Freeman.、Mm. Okay, and yeah, not a bad thing. Like if you actually ask yourself before you started. Before you started the practice, I'm not thinking about before you started doing yoga. Yoga is just asana on the mat as of now. Before you actually had a practice, like a yoga practice, contemplation inside, on and off the mat. How were we back then? Are we generally more contracting? And for me, was I tend to be a bit more contracting. I was really unhappy. I'm a really whiny person back then. I whine at everything. But I guess the practice started to, as I say, it's like just a little bit. Like Edmund, who used to whine a lot, now hardly whine. Okay, maybe the whining out ten sentences become like nine, eight. No, it's just like very gradual. Then if you keep on asking yourself, why am I whining? Because I'm not whining. It's just to express that unsatisfaction. So from the whining become. Not so much money, and eventually you don't even feel the need to whine. This is what I mean by keep on pausing over and over again until you realize that you don't even need to pause. Whining has no value to me anymore because on the inner level you felt okay with a lot of things. So this is how yoga shifted. So from very base level companionship, kind of like the, the the next vibration has started to create dissonance, and then this is where it gets really interesting because of that misalignment.、Uh, Nothing wrong. Don't don't get me. Interesting is a very kind way to. Yeah, but don't、it. get me wrong. I mean, every aspect of it is a learning experience journey. You know, is is challenge and so on and so forth. I mean, we all grow from challenge, right? But I guess it come to a point whereby, on a very higher vibration, uh, things are not aligned even remotely, and it wasn't really a big lead up to that separation. It wasn't like having argument and so on and so forth. It's just that one incident where it dawned on me that things is as it is, like seeing reality for what it is, like really stripping away all the the fluff and the filter, and seeing the reality for what it is. So that one episode was、I、actually got annoyed with my daughter and I just scolded her. What came out from me was actually. Words directed at my ex-wife. It's like you do something, you get caught in the emotion, and sometimes it's very hard to unhook yourself. But the practice is that you are able to look back and, gosh, there's so much suffering. Suffering not like big tragedy. I often say that this this are actually ordinary suffering. You go through life being unhappy, and it doesn't even you don't even realize you're unhappy until things trigger and then things overspill. So I realized that. This is really a lot of ordinary suffering, and I'm really blessed to have friends around me that I was able to share this and hold a good space. And there's always this quote that you know we talk about like, "Do not mistake the pause in between suffering as happiness." Like the companionship, the travel, all that are happy moments, but deep down, underlying is just ordinary suffering. 
So we tend to view that moment of pause as happiness, but actually you know, it's all suffering. So I, anyway, so it kind of dawned on me. Uh, me and my ex-wife have a very good, honest chat about it. And it's just realizing that, you no, know, we have actually grown apart. Not recently, it's really four years. And it's not a big thing. It's not like I wake up next day. It's not like I wake up next day, I all mala beats and so on and so forth. So. It's just like really small things. Uh, not easy. So uh, there are things that I I was really, really going back to the practice. Like, gosh, that period was so challenging. I couldn't even imagine how I survived that, but the practice kind of hold me steady mm. most of the times. I mean, at times I actually will flay. Mm. Uh, but the practice actually hold me, friends around me hold me steady. And yeah, I think I'm thankful that the parting was amicable. No, it was no animosity and things. I think that is what I can truly be grateful for. It was a close, a, a gentle close of the book. Uh, as the chapter ended. As right? much as it can be gentle, because on <laughs> the way that, the that, yeah, circumstances, yeah. Though, yeah. And yeah, and I think along the way, I'm also trying to navigate this new space I'm mm. in. You know, being, uh, being with her for almost half your, more than half your life. Yeah, because yeah. like eighteen, I'm forty three. You do the math. Yeah. <laughs> I knew her when I was 18, I'm now 43. Yeah, so like 18 times years, 2 yeah. is 36. I got another 7 years to add on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but, but, yeah, like, do not mistake a pause in between suffering as happiness. Hmm. How, how important is soul connection? Remember we talked about another different topic, like, hmm. things in isolation doesn't make sense. But when things look back, the line, the curve, the dots, Tracing back the dots actually becomes uh, a picture, like a whole okay. tapestry. So, this thing about soul connection, soul, soul means, uh, it's a very kind of thing that I heard about. Mm. I don't really get too excited about it. But uh, a book that my friend gave me for my birthday, maybe about two or three years back, uh, by Stephen Cook also. Stephen Cook. Cook. Uh, I basically read all his books. Uh, it's called Soul Friends. Mm. So he goes through like what are the potential six types of soul friend you could have in your lifetime. Yeah, six. Six. Uh, off the top of my head, like container, noble adversary, adversary, you no know, partnership, twinship, so on and so forth. I mean, it's a bit hazy now, but it gives me some idea of what actually is a soul friend. Not someone that you hey let's go out for a movie and a drink, uh-huh. but someone they can just connect on that vibration I'm talking about. Like once you connect the vibration, the higher vibration, the philosophy of life, you know, whether you like chocolate, I like vanilla, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It's the higher vibration that's actually the most important thing. Okay. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it does. It, it, it's yeah. a very supple, a subtle, and it's a very internal yeah. sensation of like trust and. We're on the same page, we're vibrating on the same yeah. level. So when you're vibrating on the same level, that means you don't have to tell me anything. Just by the fact you say something or you do something, I get you. Because mm. this is how I would mm. vibrate. Okay. Whether you like ice cream, I like you know, whether you like chocolate, I like vanilla, that one that one is like companionship kind of thing. Mm. So this is where like that book itself kinda of like planted that seed. And along the way, like having talks, deep conversation with friends around, uh before the separation kind of put me in a space where I was able to appreciate a greater totality of how we eventually connect or decide to move on. It says here, containment, yes. twinship, yes, yes. adversity, adversity mirroring, mystic resonance, mystic resonance and mm. conscious, conscious partnership. partnership. Wow, this is very in-depth. In uh, it is. And it's amazing like he can, I mean, it basically shows, and this so friend so me need not really be like your peers or anyone. Like container, in that book is actually uh, S- Stephen's grand- maternal grandmother. She mm-hmm. was a container for him to be whole. And that was really beautiful. Huh. Because he couldn't get it from his mother, which is a bit ambivalent. So right, like, right. That, that container allows you to form a sense of a self. Uh-huh. Then things like mirroring and twinship is like, 
pretty much your growing up years, people who can best friend. Like, your best friend is twinship. Kind of, yeah. Okay. Then even like mystic resonance could be someone you totally admire. Like you could play a piano and your mystic resonance could be Beethoven. Like what he does, you get it, you know? Like yeah, it might yeah, be yeah. someone that you know. It could be a different wow. generation lifetime. But what that person eventually is, create, you get it. And it vibrates at such a deep level. Okay. Yeah, so I mean this book is the kind of it's a book that allow me to uh look at things in slightly different light. Mm. Yeah, and obviously conversation with uh my Bhakti friends. <laughs> they know who they yeah, are. You know who you are. Yeah. So that was nothing short of rap deep revelation and that kind of put me in a space to realize that certain path journey connection is meant to kind of like move on mm. move on not because you move on from resentment or animosity but move on because you see that reality for what it is and this is really hard like you realize that gosh this is this is like the truth Your, yeah yeah and then how do you move on from there? And it's really scary. Also, we talked about how all this ties in with your identity. Yeah. Like you, like we talked about how you had always been the father, you had always been the husband figure. That was your identity. Mm-hmm. And you played that role for 30 over years. And then now, if you had, you had to like decide, like, okay, I, I can no longer play this role as the husband. Then who am I already? Mm-hmm. You know, who... Oh, you know, people know me for this as being this person then how can I you know everything is all distorted mm. you don't know who you are anymore there's confusion there's maybe animosity there's angst or whatever to not not say to the people around you but to yourself as mm. well right you get angry about like hey so no, so then what, what what am I now how did that how did you go through that and um, what was that like it was like in a storm mm. like I mean the best analogy I can give is like you're on this rough and the storm just toss you over and over again but what I mean there are days where I literally crash you know like I could meditate and I would just break down and this is really the truth like you just break down because what arises get so overpowering it's all stored up it's all yeah, yeah. so overpowering uh but like this trust in this practice you know going back to the yoga practice like mm. finding that steadiness finding the ease in the unease we can share that in class you know, we, we share that in class and it, it, it's great for the 16 minute class but but then again because I've been looking at the practice in that way hopefully embracing the best I can authentically so in a way, you're teaching yourself as well. It's exactly. a reminder to yourself. Exactly. Uh, like, it's easy to sit when life is great. That's what I was telling me is sitting is like, great, please. How do you sit when your whole world around you is crashing? I can tell you I don't even want to sit. But I sat. Was it great? I don't know. But I sit with it, you know. There are moments where I get clarity. There are moments what I felt was clarity crash again. So it's like you keep on going back over and over again. Mm. And what you mentioned about that identity, the the hat I've been, the multiple hat I've been wearing, it's true. You know, we get identified by the hat that we wear as we navigate through life. But then again, is that who I truly am? The fact that I'm uh, how to put it it's like you're not bound to your identity like yeah. you have the ability to change who you are at any point of your life or I wouldn't say who, change who I am because in a way or to recreate I don't know or this, redefine yeah maybe redefine is a good word to I mean like you use. are who you are from birth to death you are the same person in a sense like whatever you do you sort of know like I, I won't like this or I will like this you sort of know what you are and that is, say, your quote-unquote identity. That's who mm. you are. Uh, you know, Emma doesn't like durian, or Emma likes to eat this. Or It's very standard stuff. But as we grow, we can learn to adapt. We're the same, but then we're also different. Mm. 
So like we would have shared in class about letting go, surrender, right? These are sharing. What my practice is back to the letting go of identity, surrendering to this trust that trust. I just want people around me to be happy. Mm. I think we talked about this. Mm. So when the reality reveals itself, I realize that people around me are actually not happy. No, like ordinary suffering. Then the reason why I made the decision I made was to make people hopefully around me happy. But it's not easy. It's like they, it's hard to see happiness when you go through this big shit on a, on a personal level. Like my mom was like, why are you doing this? They may not ever see that happiness that comes from this actor. Like, yeah, like the way I look at it is like, because in a family of, let's say, three adults, you know, the day-to-day is like really, really contracting. Mm. You know, like you don't really talk much. You just go through life, yes. That's the pause in between this. Yeah, know, I mean yeah. like you have certain occasions you have a meal outside, you know. But the day-to-day itself is really, there's, there's a deep sense of underlying resentment and stuff mm. like that. So, and then the resentment also comes from the fact that of uh, not meeting expectation. Mm. I mean, these are all like, things that layer on. So when the reality reveals itself, I realized that people around me, like my mom, my ex-wife, are actually not happy. We're not arguing. Don't get me wrong, there's no big argument, but they're just not happy. And eventually, the choice I made, and from, for other people, it may seem like a very selfish choice, but it's from this place of Good compassion intention. and hoping people to be happy, and we were talking about synchronicity and how things kind of like slowly lead me to this space. Uh, I know it's not a bit... Another story. It's a whole story and yeah. it's not a bit really like woo. Yeah. But when I'm seeing that synchronicity, I'm, I'm experiencing it at times like it's so vivid, like mm. synchronicity and certain things. I cannot deny my truth. It's like, mm. I felt... What I told Lee and Max is that I felt like I'm being on this raft once again, like this big wave just pushed me to the shore, like just moved me to the shore and I cannot stop that wave. So whatever has happened, like as I said, I did those things which is in isolation. Mm. If I take a step back, it's actually one whole tapestry. You know, the line, the curve, the dots, it's actually one big picture. It's hard to understand because, but this is actually how I feel it throughout this whole couple of It may be hard to understand because we are like say, I, I will never understand the certain intricacies that happen or the synchronicities that you witnessed mm. or how you felt about those instances. But I understand it on a level where you knew it to be true. You mm. know, it doesn't have to make sense, but you just, at that moment, you felt like this is the right thing to do. Mm. And who are we to deny that as the outsider? We, we will never know what you're going through, what your family is going through or what what animosities or what tensions lie in that household. Mm. But this act, it might seem like a negative act, like say, act. Yeah, divorce, oh, I want to run away. Maybe that people will interpret it in that way. Mm. But at that point, that was what you needed to do, right? To maintain to, uh, the order again, right? Or whatever. I wouldn't say order, like, like there's this deep feeling I had inside me that I want the people around me to be happy. Mm. How do you explain that? You just want you to be happy. Mm. You know? Because if you stay together, there's a lot of unhappiness. Yeah. Then leave them. You know? and it sounds is, simple. But it's really very hard. Yeah. Because you're not leaving because of certain things you've done, it's, arguments, you know, quarrel. If, if your fight every day, very easy to It's leave. easy. It's clear it's to see that. It's because this one is no problem. Everything is fine. But nothing, it wasn't fine. You know? Yes. It was never fine to begin with. It was just, you're just cruising. Yeah. You're just numb to the pain because you felt it for so long that you never realized that, that there was the knife in your yeah. leg all along. You know, yeah. It's once you pull it out, you feel that initial like, ah, you know, that's like that. But then there's healing. That's yeah, eventually then healing. Then the healing can yeah. begin. Yeah. So it's that brave like it, it takes courage to go and like wah, rip it out yeah you know that was, that's a very good or you can leave it in and then like you know you can just continue walking with a limp and you didn't really realize it yeah I mm. you, you put it you put it really well you can put it as well as that okay thanks Angie for the question <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I think like to be honest I've, we've covered quite a lot already yeah 
I've covered uh, almost everything I wanted to cover. Okay, cool. Um, Shaha has a question. Okay. I don't think it's a very good question. Um, it's just a very generic question, but uh, I'll ask it anyway. Okay. He wants to know, where do you see yourself in five years? Wow. Good question. <laughs> good question. Uh, <laughs> you know this question we generally get asked in the corporate world? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. Yeah, like, where do you see yourself uh, in five like, years? Uh, what's your one in five year plan? Yeah, like, be this, be that. Yeah. The truth is, after what has uh, what I've went through the past maybe two years mm. with the separation and stuff, that question no longer has any bearing for me. Does that make sense? Because, it, hmm, what, let me think. Not say it has no value. It's a it's a valid question, oh. but I no longer project myself out like that timeline. Because nothing like you're, you're it's liberated like, in a sense. Kind of okay. So go back to like back then when I was in the previous marriage. Like mm. that fire makes sense. You know, fire makes sense because by then, uh, certain things, certain, yeah, certain things, yeah. and so on and so forth, right? But that was old identity. That was a identity of clinging to, mm. and that identity projects a possibility forward, and that in a way. Uh, nothing wrong it kind of gives you a, a direction trajectory but if you tell me two years ago that I'll be where I am now I would say not possible mm. never ever possible you know and then it goes mm. to show that whatever you're clinging on and whatever the fire plan you're projecting is very much dependent on where you are now based mm. on the identity now if the identity itself has been wrecked Dismantle. But I don't even know who Emmett is now. The fire projection actually has no bearing. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, not to say that's a bad question. It's a no, good that, question. The question is good, but you, uh, it wasn't meant to be answered in that way. Yes. Because yeah, yeah. Because no. I'm sure he wanted to know. Like I mean, like it's a very normal question. Where would you see yourself in five years? Mm. But then. That makes sense because that question forced you to think and through that contemplation. But how you think is through where you are now. Yeah, but exactly. But what I went through is like where I was two years ago. You my probably, whole projection yeah. is so different but this goes to say that like things change and, and, and life flows and things change but the way it weaves and change and it's really quite fascinating. Like I'm going through my experience yeah, simply I'm looking at my experience and see how I can learn from it. So a big part of it is like what is identity? That identity that you hold on to. Mm. And what happens when you lose that identity? So then what is this identity? Like is is an ident is having an identity important? Mm. So I would say, okay, this is once again just my uh, contemplation. There's two layer to that. You need an identity to go through life, mm. right? The likes or dislikes, the way you do certain things. That's kind of a identity. Mm. But if you ask yourself the identity, like the way you do certain things, is it because of a labor? Ah, are you bound by that identity? Or, or are you willing labor, to yeah. evolve? Yeah. And so. Uh, once again that's a deep philosophical question in a Buddhist context there's no self <laughs> okay this yeah. is like another whole different discussion there's no self uh, but then again the yoga has a self the absolute self does all this even mean an identity once again just different vibration so I'm not even sure I'm answering your question uh, I say yes and also no yes because how you conduct yourself forms that identity. You know? mm. But is your identity framed by the label you want to be or something that's intrinsically you? Right. You know what I'm trying to say? Because yeah. I'm this label, I need to act this certain way. Do I act like this because I'm wearing something? Exactly. Or am I really like this? Exactly. So there's yeah. actually that once again that duality. Mm. You can be Aaron free from labeling and that's your identity. 
you can be errant doing this that defines identity, but it's actually conditioned on the labeling that you want right. to be. Right, right. Make sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. So there's like one aspect of it. So you think about it, then your identity itself is actually in a way malleable. Like how I was LBY versus LAY, that's like different. LBY. Life before yoga oh. and <laughs> life, after, life after yoga. Right. But it's true, I right? like, as I yeah, mentioned, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. how my life Same. was before yoga was like, December and whiny. Yeah, like, you ask me like, just yeah, like, yeah, was I happy? I will tell you, yes, I'm happy. But why am I whining so much? No one actually asked me, why are you whining so much? No, life after yoga, am I happy? No. Why? You're not whining, but no. There's something inside me that is actually asking more. It's more. the awareness. Yeah, exactly. So, is there an entity? I don't know. Wow, interesting. Okay. I think when we talked about this long ago, this was after India, right? When we, after yeah. our yeah. India trip, then we had a lot of contemplative talks. Yeah. And I was able to relate to this identity crisis as well because I was going through my mm. own shift, if you will. And I noticed how strong an identity can be. And I said, it will, it, it helps make everything clear. People understand mm. if you are a certain way or if you do things like this, it, it makes sense. You're able to understand it. Yep. You're able to live, right? In a certain way, be through, through this mm-hmm. path. But then, again, if the world comes crumbling down, if you are no longer part of that identity or if you're letting that go, or if something forces you to change your identity, then it becomes very disruptive. You don't know who you are anymore. It's hard to, to do anything else, mm. right? Hmm. I think it's very interesting that you're going through this. I think it's very... It helps give some perspective to my situation as well or to whoever that's listening. Hmm. Not sure what to make of it. Then I will say, don't try to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if it makes sense, months, years down the road, it will make sense. So then what's the... What's the plan moving forward? For me or for the question? For, for to say this topic? Lah. Five years down the road? I mean, just, uh, I guess. Just trust? Just trust. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to look at it. Just trust. Mm-hmm. Uh, do the best you can. Mm-hmm. Trust. And then just uh, go with the flow. Honor your truth. I mean, these are things that are easy to say. You know, at times when you get greedy, ask. By the universe is hard to practice, but yeah. One last question, I think, for me um, on this topic as well, on the terms of trusting and to trust and to surrender is a very passive approach to 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 life, right? It's very passive. Like I'm just gonna sit here and I'm gonna trust things will be okay, versus a more active approach where I'm gonna do something so that I can so that things will be fine. Okay. So at what point do you, like you need to find balance. You need to find balance between the surrender and the action. You can't just, if the, there's an earthquake, I can't just sit down and say, I trust nothing will happen to me. You need to run away, right? You need Correct. to take action. Correct. So at what point do you need to take action? But you realize that your question is being framed in polarity. True, full surrender without doing anything and hoping things will be fine. Uh, like earthquake. So not, in itself, doesn't it's already sense. about balance. Exactly, like, I'm throwing the question back to you, right? Like, the other part is that you do the action, you want an outcome. Mm. Mm. Am I right to say that you're framing that way? You yeah, do something, first outcome. you want an yeah, outcome. Yes, yes. Oh. But the practice of Varagya is basically do the work and let go of the outcome. That is actually that trust. Nice. That is actually that. That is actually a practice. You I do the see. work, like, I do my work, I, I come, I share the practice. And you let go of the I let results. go of whether you get it or not. Like, I mentioned earlier, like, whether you get what I'm trying to say I I hope you get it likewise I am also fine you don't get it I'm so fine you're frustrated when you top out from standing poses but who knows I'm just trying to plant that seed I may not be the one that watered it mm. no that could be your teacher down the road that watered that seed mm. but I hope to be the one that planted the seed such that down the years you know, when we do share again when you top out of the standing balance pose you're in a state of Please. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Yeah, that that's like in a way, as you say, when you trust to that extent, it's yeah. actually liberating. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that you don't do the work. Yeah. And the thing is we tend to equate the outcome with the work we do. We don't really embrace the process. Right. Yeah. And and like back to teaching for example, we put so much effort in learning the craft, sequencing, queuing, hoping people get it. You hope people get it, that's the outcome. But don't forget that you have honed your craft, practice, sequence. This is the mark of you as a teacher, not whether the people get it or not. Mm. We tend to blur that line. People come with their own situation, their own whatever, like they come and if they don't get it at that time, it is not it's, a reflection of you. Yeah. You know, it is just at that particular time you did what you needed to do. If everybody's all angsty or and that's they came at a bad place, yeah. it is you gotta let go of that. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, it's hard to share from that space. When you have a room full of how many pair of vibes Different you energies you, yeah. all bouncing around. Yeah, so not to say it doesn't get me, it does get me. So it's just being true and honest. Like we're all humans, we get affected by what you share, hopefully we get it. But it's a matter of like you get affected, but how 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 long that that feeling of ah why stays with you? You know what I'm saying? It's like it's like the thought, that feeling of like, ah, why people like don't like the class. It, it happens, like, especially when you team and put so much effort in it. But it's like, that feeling of, ah, could be that maybe half an hour. And it doesn't... And afterwards, it's yeah. yeah. But it gets tricky when it stays with you for days. Yeah. Months. When right? you hold on to it. Like- yeah. So, that stirring of, ah, why is part of human experience. How you're able to shift to maybe a better state of space and community is your practice. Mm. <sighs> you sound exhausted. It's interesting. Well, um, any final words? Uh, I never really imagined myself talking to the camera. <laughs> uh, sorry, the microphone. Uh, but I guess it also goes to show that what I think is or is not is never the concrete truth. And I guess uh, Aaron has been very encouraging, dropping hints over the months. Uh, and the initial instinct is that no, I, I don't really want to be on things that's on social media. I mean, yeah. Because for me, the practice is very personal. As I mentioned, like when times were simpler before social media, what you do is very simple. And most that people in the class see or feel. Now it has become too complicated. You lay on so many things, right? Mm. Maybe I'm old school. To me, what I don't admit is very personal. Mm. Yet, having said that, when I share, it's personal, but yet it becomes more open. Mm. As much as I can, I still would like to withdraw because I'm still introvert into this more personal space. So. Once again, never imagine myself here. But having said that, I also do regret the sharing we had for this. Actually, this past few months, right? Things I shared in this past, like our plus also. Mm. Some part of it, I don't think is alien to you, mm. right? I shared before. Mm. Whether in depth or not, I think depends. Yeah, some I think is a bit new to you. Mm. Yeah, so so this is where I felt like as a community, get a conversation going. No, have an honest conversation but instead of listening with the ears listen with the heart we forget that we tend to listen with ears and when the ears get pricked we feel uncomfortable when you listen with the heart you begin to see where the other person is speaking from hmm. yeah. well I'm glad that you took the opportunity uh, the, the chance to, to do this with me We've always had a lot of interesting Prata conversations and I've always wanted to share that with people and now mm. I got the chance. So thank you. Thank you. For opening up. Uh, on that note, we f- fucking clear. We're, we're done. <laughs> we're done. And uh, I guess the last question is from Lee. She wants to know why you don't have Instagram. <laughs> I'm sure has, you've it, answered that question already. with yeah. this whole podcast for yeah, the good. So like, that, they kind of like self-explanatory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I just wanted to say that out loud. Okay. 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 Thank you, thank you. One now. Yeah. Oh.
was it? I love it. Okay. And that's it. That's the end of the podcast. Uh, I'm sorry, Shao, that I said that your question was lame. <laughs> uh, I get, I guess it's, I guess it's how you perceive that question. And I, I guess I wasn't, I, I wasn't very contemplative. I wasn't as contemplative enough to answer that question as creatively as Edmund could have. So, hmm, my bad. Hmm. If you wanna, if you wanna tune into the party that I did with Xiao Hao, he's on episode two. You can check that out as well. Uh, he answers all my questions really well. Smart guy. I'm glad. I'm glad to be able to be friends with all these smart people, these extraordinary, wise people. Oh, what's that? I think my neighbors. <laughs> yeah. And if you like what you hear, subscribe. Drop me a message on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Let me know what you think. Um, and uh, there are a couple of free yoga practice, yoga podcast practices, bleh, yoga podcast practice episodes for you on this channel. If you want to do them, if you want to go and do them, just, you know, just go listen to it. Lah. And they're all free. It's donation based. So if you want to give a little something, something, you can. The links for the teachers who you... Uh, the, the donation links for each teacher is within that episode so you can donate to them not me but if you do enjoy listening to this podcast you can donate and support it by buying me a coffee again all the links in the description below in the thing okay uh, thanks thanks for guys for fucking waiting for the next episode to be out I know I've been out for a long time three months ish Good to be back. Glad to be able to be in your ears again. Ooh. Thanks for listening. Okay, bye.